When it comes to the local percentage of known serial killers in South America, Colombia surprisingly takes the lead. It mustn't come as a shock that three of the most prolific ones in history are Colombian. This cannot be a mere coincidence. Pedro Alonso Lopez confessed to around 300 murders, Luis Alfredo Garavito more than 200, and Daniel Camargo Barbosa 157. Without even mentioning the isolated cases, the frequency of these types of crimes in Colombia is higher than one might think, and the number of victims also points to a necessary acknowledgement by society, authorities, and the police. In 2012, 32-year-old Colombian Luis Gregorio Ramirez Maestre was discovered as one of the most lethal, gruesome, and despicable killers in recent international crime chronicles. What is shocking is 1. His popular claims to date that he has never killed his victims and 2. The intricate way he tied his victims up that made them kill themselves which earned him his alias, the Rope Monster. How did he perpetuate these acts of violence of this, killing more than 40 motorcycle drivers? Stick around to find out. Informal motorcycle passenger transportation, commonly known as mototaxismo, is a highly popular means of transportation in Colombia. To this day, it has not been legalized or regulated. More than 60% of fatal road accidents involve motorcycles, which is relatively understandable considering they make up 83% of vehicles in the country. Many young Colombians see mototaxismo as a good source of work without the higher financial investment required for a car. However, it is a risky job, exposing them to constant criminal threats. Starting in 2009, reports of the disappearance of several motor taxis in various cities and municipalities of Colombia began to alarm the police. It was common for the motorcycles to disappear, not their drivers, which immediately drew investigators' attention. All the missing drivers were between 19 and 30 years old, less than 170 centimeters tall and weighed less than 60 kilograms, a highly specific profile. They were all working on their motorcycles, serving as motor taxis between Tenerife, Sabana Larga, Agawica, Santa Marta, Valle Dupar, and Puerto Wilches. When the first bodies started to appear, the police immediately sought the help of specialists. It became evident that the case was much more complex than it seemed. The victims were found in remote and isolated places away from the main roads. They were lightly coerced and threatened to venture into the jungle and then tied with a rope to a thick tree. However, these were not ordinary bindings. All victims had perished by asphyxiation due to a complex system of pulleys, which operated mechanically, forcing the individual to strangle themselves with their body weight due to exhaustion. This process could take a few minutes, hours or even a couple of days, depending on the type of knots the killer tied and how he immobilized them. Some were tied with their hands and feet facing the tree, with the rope passing behind them and tightening around their neck. After a few minutes, the person began to tire due to the uncomfortable position and the weight of their body, causing the neck knot to tighten more and more until they died. Others were found sitting with their backs against a tree, hands tied and legs extended forward at a 45-degree angle. Their ankles were tied to a branch that ran down to make a complex knot around their neck, suffocating them when they could no longer keep their legs up. In none of these cases was death quick, and no matter how much the killer fled with the money and motorcycles, the cruelty of his method was incomprehensible, too elaborate and sophisticated to be a simple thief. Nonetheless, no clues were obtained about him or the culprits. By 2012, the situation became critical. More than 40 motor taxis had been reported missing, 22 of whom were found dead in the middle of the jungle, tied and strangled. John Gyro Armador, an 18-year-old mototaxista, would be the last victim. On Sunday, May 20th, 2012, John Gyro got up very early and left his parents' house around 6 in the morning because the day before, he had met someone who requested a well-paid ride for the next day. The young man, who was working to save money for his university studies, did not hesitate to respond to this client's call. However, by midday, his parents and siblings began to worry as John Gyro did not answer his phone. After a few minutes, the young man's phone started to ring as it turned off, raising more concerns in the family. They decided to call his girlfriend's house, but she informed them that she couldn't reach him either. 
Finally, John Gyro's parents approached the police to file a report. When the agents noted the physical characteristics of the young man who was less than 170 centimeters tall and worked as a moto taxista, they understood that the chances of finding him alive were slim. Two days later, on Tuesday, May 22nd, the police found John Gyro's body in the middle of a palm plantation in Tenerife. Like the other murdered motor taxis, the young man was tied to a tree where he had fought for his life for several hours before dying from suffocation due to the rope around his neck, which was also tied to his hands and feet. The authorities' frustration was almost as great as that of the victim's family. Still, all the police officers involved in the case were determined to unmask and apprehend the killer once and for all. One of the younger officers had the idea to inquire about the model of the young man's cell phone, which was a high-end device. The police decided to monitor it since the motor taxi star's killer usually stole the victim's phones but never used them. When the agent realized that this particular phone was much more modern than the others, he had a hunch that the criminal might turn it on and use it. Three days later, the central telephone office alerted the police that the young man's phone had been turned on and a SIM card had been inserted, belonging to the number of the person who had requested the last ride from the victim. This last call was discovered thanks to the central office. At the same time, a roadside security camera recorded a person riding John Gyro's motorcycle on the day of his disappearance, heading towards Medellin, where the cell phone signal was traced. This led the police to discover that constant calls were being made from that device to a landline number. When the agents began to monitor the house associated with that landline, they found that a family lived there and the homeowner frequently arrived with various motorcycle models for restoration or sale of spare parts. Neighbors assumed he was a mechanic or reseller of such vehicles. The suspect finally had a name, Luis Gregorio Ramirez Maestre, 32 years old. At that time, the alleged killer was not at home, where he lived with his partner and three children. The police learned that he had to appear in Santa Marta for a banking transaction and that's where they arrested him on December 12, 2012 without any resistance. Little is known about Luis Gregorio Ramirez Maestre's childhood. He was described as a normal boy by those who knew him. He was born in the town of Mina Seca de Valledupar on September 30, 1980. He claimed his family was well-structured and he never suffered abuse or mistreatment. He didn't complain about a poor economic situation. In fact, he said it was the opposite. He got along well with the neighborhood kids and played soccer every day. He studied until ninth grade but dropped out of school, supposedly due to the presence of paramilitary groups in the area. One of his sisters stated that he ran away from home at the age of 15 because he didn't like going to school. Later, he joined the army and then an anti-insurgent military organization where he learned lethal techniques including the use of the rope. After his arrest, the suspect confessed to the 22 murders the police were investigating. Still, authorities believe he killed around 60 people over five years. With a chilling calmness that reveals a clear psychopathic profile, Gregorio Ramirez Maestre admitted to all the charges against him. However, he claimed not to be a serial killer and said he was part of a criminal group that killed motor taxi drivers across the country solely to steal from them. This hypothesis is not very convincing, especially considering the unorthodox method of killing the victims. According to the accused, it was a highly elaborate plan devised by his superiors. General George Vargas stated to the Colombian magazine, Semana, that there is no evidence to suggest he belonged to outlawed groups, nor that the murders were committed by an organization or a group. The investigation leaves no doubt that he acted alone and he has already confessed to 22 of these crimes. Several of these confessions were made to judges after his arrest. These types of murders have not occurred again in the country. The killer's elaborate method did not go unnoticed by psychologists and criminologists who followed the case. After being tied with the rope, the victims began a fatal countdown. Fatigue mixed with desperation and death could take several hours to arrive. The killer would simply watch, possibly entranced by the disturbing scene. 
According to the killer, his victims died within 30 seconds of being tied. However, this was refuted by forensic experts who stated that some of the young victims had suffered for two days before succumbing to slow asphyxiation. In an interview with the Colombian magazine Semana, Luis Gregorio Ramirez Maestri explained the method. I quote, It's a method we learned during training that lasted about 15 days in Uraba. If you did it wrong, you had to disassemble and start over. It was a morning and afternoon routine until we learned the method of how things should be done. There are three very difficult knots. The neck loop activates when the hand loop is activated. In other words, as soon as you stretch your legs, the wrist loop activates, and in turn, the neck loop activates, which is the strongest one. As soon as a person moves, their breathing is cut off immediately." Unquote. Bondage is a sexual practice that involves the use of restraints, handcuffs, or tapes to immobilize another person. In theory, this sexual activity doesn't seek harm, as it doesn't use pain as a source of pleasure, but rather domination. However, in practice, some serial killers have learned and perfected these techniques to torture and murder their victims. One of the most emblematic cases is that of the serial killer known as Veet, who attacked and strangled a dozen people over decades while his victims writhed helplessly in their restraints. Luis Gregorio Ramirez Maestri watched the young men he tied to trees for hours before leaving. He watched them die and seemed to derive enjoyment from it. In this sense, it doesn't differ much from the profile of the killer, Beat. This case, which was called Monstruo de la Soga, caused great outrage among the Colombian population. The public saw him as a ruthless, cowardly killer who meticulously planned his attacks with a horrifying coldness. It was discovered that days before killing a moto taxi driver, he would cancel a couple of short rides to gain the victim's trust and catch him off guard when he decided to strike. Luis Gregorio Ramirez Maestri wore a sinister smile whenever he talked about his crimes, as if he felt proud of their effectiveness and his sickening method of killing. In the few interviews he gave, he only attempted to portray himself as a victim because people labeled him a psychopath or monster. Despite offering televised apologies to the families of his victims, it was evident that his words were empty. He didn't show the slightest sign of remorse or emotion. Currently, he is in the maximum security wing of the Valley Dupa prison, sharing a yard with another serial killer, Luis Alfredo Garavito Cubilos. He will be released from prison in the year 2032, when he has been in prison for 20 years, due to the reductions of sentences in the Colombian justice system of three-fifths of the sentence.